Gary, how you, how, <laughs> how you earn your keep? How do I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm so honored to be in such presence of such dignitaries. I'm overwhelmed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, DLD, Steph. Thank you, Yassi. I head the Consumer Electronics Association. It's a trade association of uh, 2,200 technology companies. It's a nonprofit based in the United States. We focus mostly on the U.S. in terms of policy, but in terms of events, we're worldwide. We have an event in uh, two weeks in Shanghai, CES Asia. It's a launch, but it's pretty big. Uh, and we, of course, have the international CES in Las Vegas in January, which is the largest innovation event in the world. And you all should be there. After you go to, to DLD, Tel Aviv. How many people you had this uh, January in Las Vegas? Uh, we'll be announcing shortly that it's well over 170,000. It's not open to the public. 170. 170,000. 170 people in one show. And what, uh, what, was the, what were the main themes this year? We had a lot. I mean, we had over 3,600 companies with uh, actual exhibits. Um, but there were some real trends that were there which were pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. One was uh, driverless cars or semi-autonomous vehicles, which are clearly the future, and that will grow. Every major car company was there. They're, they're not about horsepower anymore. They're, what they're about is technology. And we're heading towards this very safe world of driverless cars. And it'll, it, it'll be interesting getting there because it is so disruptive. Uh, also, speaking of disruption, drones. Um, drones are, the rest of the world knows drones perhaps for some of the bad things they, they can do to people. But drones are, are delivering medicine in South America. They're also uh, finding lost kids. They're inspecting bridges. They're doing helping in agriculture. And pretty soon there'll be rooftop to rooftop deliveries which will eliminate some of the traffic here. We estimate, we released an estimate yesterday actually that there'll be one million drone deliveries, drone deliveries in the United States in just a few years on a daily basis. And but that will cut down on traffic, it'll help health, it'll cut down on pollution, it'll be green, and it will be pretty much not noticed because drones are already capable of avoiding each other. You started your current job in 1991, I was just about to, I was just one of, those are two of ten themes. You want to go back to my ancient history? This no, could no, take I, the whole time. Okay, no, if you are only two, why don't we let you go? I just wanted to, to ask you what was then, you know, but we, we, we can... Well, what we, so I started in 1991 running the CES. It was a what third, was then the shape? It was about a third of the size and it was a lot smaller, but, but what we were, the were now, it was, TV, it was TV sets, VCRs, CDs were, were introduced. It was very exciting, you know, you had all sorts of things, and we were working very hard towards HDTV. I spent a part of my career developing that, that so we could have a good H, uh, standard and launch, uh, and, and we did. And we also, in terms of, I want to get back to some of the things. So we had Ultra HD 4K, that's the, at this show. That's taken off big time, and that's, you know, it's thin, it's flat, it's four times the number of pixels, but it's also better pixels. It shows contrast, it shows reality. What's really also interesting is wireless health. That's certainly exploded the show. So. This all comes down to, the, so I have a Fitbit on me as well, and it measures my heart rate and chest, how excited I am to be up here. But it does a lot of things. It vibrates when I uh, wake up, so the alarm doesn't have to go off. It tells me who's calling. And obviously, the wrist is a whole new area of real estate that's being developed. But health care generally and all these other things are radically changing very quickly. It comes down to the fact that there's over a million smartphones, a billion rather, that have been sold around the world. Those billion smartphones have sensors in them, the accelerometers, the gyroscopes, all the different sensing devices, and they've gotten so cheap that very clever people are putting them together and connecting them. That's the Internet of Things. We had 900 companies showing how you could connect products. And there, they'll be predictive, they'll be helpful, they'll tell you when you're likely to get sick, they'll tell you if someone's in your home, they'll tell you if you need attention, and a lot of things will be done for us. And the problems that we're talking about today that we're worried about in terms of health care and diseases and famine and starvation and clean water and things like that are going to be solved by technology and these devices. And, and you know, th when I just heard the first presentation, the first interview, I mean, it's disruptive. It's happening. Look at all those magazines going to be put out of business because someone has a better way using technology, which is gathering knowledge and allowing it to do really, really good things. And that's the future, and that's why I'm excited. Now, what was your question? No, you, you said you have ten trends, and I counted so far four. What are the other six? Oh, the other <laughs> well, obviously, there's, there's, so, there's robotics is very, very big. There's, um, there's also all sorts of things designed for young kids. 
So th there was we have a portion of the show called Eureka Park, which yeah, is uh, over amazing. almost 400 companies that are startups. We folk we love startups. We focus on startups. We're passionate in the fact that we believe that anyone with an idea should be able to expose it to 150, actually 170,000 plus people, and do it. So the startups get a subsidized little area of the show, and it is the most buzzworthy crowd because you get a lot of scientists. They've been laid off from companies or they have an idea, and they just show really incredible new things. And you go from a company like uh, Oculus Rift to kind of being a startup to one month later they're so sold for $2 billion to Facebook. It's kind of exciting. You know, I interviewed in Barcelona Slava Rubin. You know Slava is uh, Indiegogo doing uh, uh, crowdsourcing finance. And he told us that in the last seven years he funded 300,000 initiatives. So funding uh, the first stage, you know, this is like a year or two years before it comes to your show, is able to see what are the trends. And first of all, evaluate what you say, say robot, personal robots, drones, uh, wearable, etc. I asked him what is the current uh, upcoming trend. He told me smart vibrators. I asked him vibrators of cement. He said no. Uh, what is your view on the... You so let's talk about answer. something I want to talk about. So disruptive innovation is very important. <laughs> um, so what we did, uh, we announced this two weeks ago, is we evaluated each of the states in the United States, and we determined whether their Shh. government favors innovation or not. And we gave 10 criteria from their broadband speeds to how quickly it could become a business to the tax structure to whether they favor things like Uber or Lyft. And then we rated the states. and. Uh, and I think we may go forward and do it internationally as well because we've gotten such a phenomenal response. I've, I'm, last week I, I met with five different governors five different times because they're so into this and knowing about how their state can, can excel. And frankly, New York was not in the top tier. And I know, how many of you are New Yorkers by a show of hands? A, a large number. Do you know that the New York City Taxi Cab Commission has just issued something last week that requires that Uber, before they could change their their app, which is they do every month or two, it has to be submitted ahead of time and approved by the New York State Taxi This is the first time in our technology world history that, that a city government is requiring prior permission to change an app. And this, we are going to fight this to the death in New York City, and I'm very concerned about it. That was my big message today, is that New York City is in danger of ruining the world of innovation uh, through a taxi commission of all places, which is terrible. So, Which um, one is on the top of your list? Right now, it's New York City this week. But uh, honestly, the no, you're I mean as, as innovators. Or as oh, in the innovators? Innovator friendly. Everyone expects California, but California has high taxes, bad regulation, and they're, uh, they, they don't allow a flexible workforce. So Utah, Virginia, North Carolina. So, so I'm sorry? So people are Michigan. People are mazukis that are uh, gravitating to the anti-innovation. Well, every state, no state's perfect, but if you look at the 10 criteria, they're, and I'm ha they're on our website, you're happy to look at them. It's, it's what we think is important in terms of a state being friendly towards innovation. California clearly is doing a lot of things right, but they're doing, look, there's more companies moving out of California than into California, and that's just a fact. And New York, New York State, I don't have to tell the New York residents here, has the highest tax rates with California in the country. And that, that does not encourage people, especially people who make money, to stay in the state. And people who make money, are the, they're the, the ones who can leave the quickest. Which is not what I really wanted to talk about. I want to talk about innovation and why it's important. But I, you want to talk about other stuff. Go ahead. No, no, no. I want, in the, in the recent years, you really became obsessed with innovation. You are now more uh, evangelist of innovation than evangelist of uh, consumer electronics. I suspect. Well, innovation goes way beyond consumer electronics. On, on Sunday, I was in Denver speaking before 3,000 of the top research doctors in, in uh, vision doctors in the world, and most of them from outside the United States. And, you know, they want to break out of what they're doing. They see the barriers, and, and you know, this type of uh, presentation we heard before is totally applicable. Everything is changing. If your business has not yet been disrupted, it will be. And that's just a fact. And it, 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 the only one that is safe, Yasi, is, is events like this one. Because we still want to get together and then have that face live to live experience and develop relationships. And even that, maybe 100 years from now, the, the, you know, the, the devices, the robots will be so good that we'll just be talking to each other and simulating and things like that. But, but we'll, be look, we'll be watching that from somewhere else. You and I. Yes. <laughs> what, uh, what your, uh, what your uh, members 
in your association are doing to, to uh, enhance innovation? Well, first, we encourage the startup culture, number one. Number two, we want to desperately, we want to change the laws in this country on patent trolls because that, that patent trolls are the enemy of innovation because they, once you get a patent demand letter from a troll, your funding dries up, you, you can't go forward as a startup. And even if you're a starter with a company, you devote your resources and your technical time and, your, and any, any revenue you have to paying for lawyers and using your engineering talent to defend a spurious lawsuit. So we're, we're, we're on the verge of pushing that past the finish line. We have President Obama, we have the Republicans and Democrats in the House. We just got a bill introduced last week in the Senate. It's bipartisan, and we think we can get over the finish line. That's our goal for this year. We also want to you know, have the U.S. join the rest of the world in free trade, and we want to get the best and the brightest to the United States. And our immigration policy here is absolutely absurd. You know, we spend $6 billion a year investing in science and research in the National Science Foundation. Most of that's done by graduate students who are not U.S. citizens. We train them, then we kick them out. That's not a good recipe to run a good country. So w U.S. has done a great job, but we can't be complacent, and we have to stop being stupid. So our job as a trade association is to tell government, and everyone agrees with us. That's a sad thing, and not everyone, but most members of Congress, and certainly President Obama, agree we have to change these policies. Are uh, U.S. losing its uh, grips on innovation? Well, the U.S. and Israel, the two most innovative countries in the world if, by most measures, patents per person, yeah, it's you and me, I'll take credit. You, yeah, you've done a lot, but I don't know what I've done. But in terms of you know, patents per person or, or startups, however you want to measure it per capita. But I think it's important to stay paranoid, as Andy Grove would say. I think you have to always get better, and you can't be complacent. And we have a lot of complacency in the United States right now. There's, there's portions of the public that think it, that being number one in a bunch of areas is our God-given destiny. And no matter what we do stupid, it's not going to change. And that's a very dangerous position to be in. On the positive th side, there are groups like this, the people here. There's, there's an entrepreneur culture. We, we, we are always asking, why not? And we don't do great on standardized tests. I'll recognize that in STEM, and we're concerned, and we should be. But we have a culture of risk, a culture of entrepreneurship, a culture of innovation, and always pushing back. And part of it, our biggest strength, and I would say this is Israel's strength as well, is our diversity. We are the most diverse countries in the world, and I've been to some of the Asian countries and elsewhere. Everyone just agrees with everyone. It's really, it's not a good way to ever get anything done. And when you build up teams, when you start your startup, when you do things, you have to get different people with different strengths, different skills, different backgrounds. And that's, that's a good thing. Most people view it as like, you know, those are mongrel countries. I don't buy that. I think that's why we're doing well. One word about China, one word about Europe. Okay, I'll, uh, China is, is huge, and we have to be there. They want to shift over to innovation. They have a, in their five-year plan, they want a certain number of patents per 100,000 people. It's producing a lot of very bad patents, but they want to shift from a manufacturing society to an innovation and culture and consumption society. And they know what they're doing, and they're investing heavily in infrastructure. I would not rule them out in the future. They have a very good strategy, and they can execute quicker and better than almost any other country. Um, Europe. I think is facing some serious challenges. I think their strategy stems, is goes between let's encourage innovation and entrepreneurship, and let's do some things right, and really encourage and change our tax laws and our labor laws and all the things that are hurting innovation, and going to, as have just been revealed in the, uh, I think it's a Bloomberg story yesterday, we want to attack all the major American companies because they're, they're too strong and too powerful, and we want to shut them down. I think Europe has to also cut down, and it's a good strategy. They're talking about doing it. It's cutting down the, b the borders between all the different countries so you could have one digital Europe. That makes total sense. It's one of the advantages the United States has. But I think attacking successful companies is a really bad strategy for a, for a region or a portion of the world. We have another 52 seconds, so this is your chance to do a shameless, to compete with Juan Huldean, to do a shameless uh, promotion to your book, uh, Ninja Innovation. Go ahead. Well, Ninja, there's two books. One is The Comeback, which is about policies for governments for innovation, and it's ended up with me going around the world a lot and talking to different governments. This is Ninja Innovations about the fact that I have had the privilege and honor of knowing a lot of the major CEOs around the world and talking to them, and also it combines with the fact that I have a black belt in Taekwondo with the fact ah. that Jap Japanese are ninjas, and ninjas always solve problems creatively. They always get better. They take advantage of opportunities. That's how my kids are raised. That's how we talk with our employees. Solve a problem creatively. Always do something different. Think outside your comfort zone. Do something different. And be a ninja. And you are the ultimate ninja, Yossi. So I thank you very much for uh, interviewing me. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Shapiro.